Football is back, and so is winning season at MyBookie. Use promo code GATERS at MyBookie.ag to claim your deposit bonus for a limited time to get a free chip to use in the MyBookie casino. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with MyBookie. Gators Breakdown is a proud to partner with AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash Gators to try. This episode of Gators Breakdown is also brought to you by BetterHelp. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Gators today and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Gators. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. I am your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. And as you can see, if you're watching the YouTube version, former Gator great tight end, Tate Casey, joining me right here on Gators Breakdown on the heels of the release of Swamp Kings on Netflix. Tate, you and I were talking beforehand. You said, hey, man, my phone's blowing up. This thing has kind of just been looking – You know, the Gator Nation has been looking forward to this documentary ever since uh, – I, heck, I don't even know. I mean, I think they've been working on this for quite a while. I know uh, you shared some images on social media, and it had been quite some time from when you did your interview uh, with, with Netflix and the producers there. So uh, thanks for hopping on Gators Breakdown and giving us uh, your look in an even deeper look at Swamp Kings on Netflix. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me. I mean, it's uh, been a long time coming for, I think, a lot of the players. It's one of those things that we've looked forward to, you know, having these kind of things come up. Uh, after our college careers and getting a chance to look back on some things. So it's been fun. Man, it, uh, it, it's certainly a hit the nostalgia button uh, for, for a lot of us as, as, as a fan base. I'm sure it did for you players as well. Yeah, and, it, and it's awesome to see, you know, you, you get the response of people who were in college. And I get on my timeline, people you went to college with that are, that are seeing it and have reached out. And, you know, as players, it's just cool to kind of reminisce and, and look back on what we accomplished and, I'll be honest, with you, I only watched two episodes last night for the first time. I've got two more to go. And, and just the chills that you get watching it because it brings back so many fond memories of those workouts. Um, and, <laughs> you know, the, the games and you, you kind of think back and go, oh, man, I can't I forgot that that happened in that game. And so hey, there's a lot of good, bad and ugly um, from 05 to 08 in regards to games that were played and, you know, maybe some things that we left on the table in, in some of those matchups. But it's just awesome to see some of the guys that were a part of this documentary talk about it um, and, and how they spoke on certain things. And I think it really gives a good look inside the team mentality um, that we had and, and how we prepared and how we kind of got ready in January, February for a season that was, you know, six months away. Yeah, absolutely. So everybody hit that like button, subscribe to Gators Breakdown if you haven't done so yet. I'll, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of it right here. Uh, Tate, and I, Tate and I actually got together a couple, well, a few years ago. We yeah. got a yeah, championship rewind for the 06 and 08 title games. So we won't go too much into what we you know, talked about there. There was plenty of specifics in this documentary, but if you want to relive uh, with Tate Casey, with Brandon James, it was Championship Rewind. I shared them on social media. Uh, they're my, on the favorites on the playlist on YouTube, so you guys can get even more of Tate's thoughts on you know, specifically those title games and leading up to those title games. Uh, but Tate, let's, let's start at the beginning of the documentary. You're already at Florida. Ron Zook is fired. They're, gonna, they're looking for a head coach. You and I haven't discussed this before, but was Urban on your you guys' radar as a player? Because, I mean, look, he was kind of the hot name. It was either Urban Meyer or Bob Stoops. I mean, Bob Stoops' name is every time a job opens up at Florida, <laughs> Bob yeah, Stoops' name's in there. Yeah. <laughs> so was, was Urban's name the name for you players as well, or was it kind of just coming out of left field? You know, it's, it's kind of funny because as I look back of the, the Ron Zook firing and what it – you know, what happened after the fact and the lame duck coach, there's a lot of things that you remember. And there's a lot of things that you look back and go, man, I don't even think I thought about any of that. Like as an 18 year old, you're focused on going to class and you're focused on just preparing for each game. And Charlie Strong was that interim coach after the FSU game and you're getting ready for bowl season. And I remember conversations. I remember certain guys mindsets and hearing, you know, Hey, we're looking at this guy and we watched Utah in the bowl game and you knew, 
Utah was a good team, you know, and you heard a bit about Urban Meyer. Up until the point of the coaching search, I don't even know if I had really even thought much about Urban Meyer or Utah for that matter, you know, being that far out West. And it's kind of funny because in the SEC and the Big 12 and the Big 10, on the East Coast, you're in that bubble of, you know, you, you know, even mm. the ACC. You're really like you, you see a lot of games of three or four conferences. You're not staying up and watching West Coast football. You're not really watching Pac-10. And the only thing I vividly remember when Urban kind of got into the mix of the coaching search was hearing it as a, a spread offense. And, mm. you know, I think most of those conversations came between me and my dad and, and you know, me and relatives that were like, you know, if that happens, like, what are you, what are you going to do? You know, like, what, what are your plans? You know, and I was coming off a of freshman season that for me was a great, you know, starting point as a freshman, um, as a true freshman. And, and you think about it, I had to go to baseball season, you know, with Gators baseball in, in 2005 spring. So I literally turned the corner from the bowl game into baseball season. Um, and so that was kind of like the, the first thing on my mind was like, I, I've got to focus on getting, to baseball and figuring out the schedule with workouts and baseball and everything else. And so I had a whole thing going on. Um, me and Ron Zook and, and Larry Fedora, when I got recruited, baseball was on the table. That's what I was going to do. And then when Urban came in, you know, the, a lot of that kind of, there was a dynamic there trying to figure out exactly how to make that work. And I can tell you this as a 215 pound freshman tight end, that every SEC coach would want at 260 and being a pitcher on a baseball team, the, the last thing they cared about was, you know, me playing baseball. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of dynamic there and, and that's a conversation for another day, but you know, his name popped up and then once it started getting deeper and deeper, I thought you started to understand like, okay, this is probably reality and you know, let's see what it's about. And I think that my first, you know, couple weeks, seeing talking to urban team meeting when he first came in it didn't take long to realize what he was about right it didn't take long to realize what he was trying to do like his mindset and he understood the assignment like his mindset was he knew he had to come into florida and win games um and you know i think when you follow ron zook who was a great recruiter um won games larry fedora was a great offensive coordinator we had a great offensive you know set of talent we had a really good defensive set of talent a lot of young guys um, he knew he had some guys in the locker room that could help him get there. I think the biggest thing was just the small discipline things, those small things in life, going to class, doing the right things in the weight room was really the turning point. And if he could hammer that home in the first few weeks of Matt drills off season training, uh, which he did, um, you know, we'd have a shot. Tate, was there ever a point where you, or you have a story of people questioning it? of questioning the spread offense and if it was going to work or maybe the first impression of Urban Meyer and if those mat drills were really worth it and if it was really going to pay off. I mean, we go to the documentary in that first season, you go to Alabama, get beat 31-3, to three, and the spread offense is getting questioned and if it will work in the SEC. So going through spring, going up to maybe even that loss and losing to LSU as well, um, that was there like a thought that, Eh, I, I don't know if this is going to work. Cause look, I, I know you personally enough. You're not going to quit. You're not a quitter. Right. Uh, and, but w was there the question that came up of, is, is it really going to work? Yeah. It's, you know, there were certain, there were certain moments where, cause when you come from Larry Fedora and Ron Zook, right. And Zombrecker, we ran a lot of tight end. We ran a lot of, you know, 12 personnel, we ran 11 personnel. And so you go from that to pretty much a four wide, five wide set. Um, with that H-back role, right, and I think that that was my first introduction to the possibility of, you know, being more of a hybrid tight end to an H-back role slot receiver, which a slot receiver was nothing to me, right? In high school, did that, did a lot of blocking on, on DBs in high school uh, on the ball tight end. Didn't do a lot of H-back stuff before Urban came in. Uh, I think he, he had a couple of guys, you know, at Utah that they dabbled with some creative things. But not necessarily true tight end bodies. It was more, you know, ex-quarterbacks and, and some wide receivers that were bigger bodies. And I think for me, it was just understanding, one, there's nothing set in stone, right? At some point, you've got to realize in the SEC, you've got to be able to play 11 personnel. Like, it, it, it's, it's a given. And you see where Urban went with it, right? I mean, 
you start with the, the five wide, four wide, and then you start to work in those combination sets of tight end, H-back, slot receiver. And, you know, we saw that over the years, and it just grew from there. Started in 05 with Billy Latsko and myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that really the tipping point for that was the Georgia game um, in 05. I think Urban really started to realize, okay, you know what? We've got some talent in certain spots that can allow us to do things. And we can still keep that creative spread mindset, but we can also start doing some things that, that no other teams are doing. And you kind of got to give kudos to, to him and Dan Mullen for some of the stuff that they could draw up um, based on the talent that they had. But I think Urban started to think freely with what he had in the locker room, right? What kind of talent he had. Billy Latsko, in my opinion, is probably one of the most undervalued players on that 016. And, and I mean that as he's not – He's a household name, right? He's a guy who played in the NFL. Um, but he was one of those guys that he probably doesn't get a lot of recognition for what he did. Um, and he's, he's probably worth his weight in gold uh, for what he did to contribute on offense in 2005 and 2006. Um, and so, you know, it grew from there. I, I think for me, just understanding, hey, if you work for this guy and you buy in, you're going to find a way to get yourself on the field. Right. And I've never been one of those guys that really wanted too much uh, attention. And when you look, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Dave, when you look left and you've got Jamel Cornelius and Dallas Baker and you look right and you've got, you know, Bubba Caldwell and some of the talent that we had on those teams, even in, in 05, 06, uh, you'll, you'll find the field however you can. Um, and for me, unfortunately, it went from being a pass catching tight end under Ron Zook to – you better be willing to block 255 pound, 260 pound middle linebackers pulling in the in the A gap, B gap on counter plays for Percy, Demps, Rainey. Like I, that was my life, so I had to figure that out real quick. It was either that or you know take the door. And yeah. when you ask if there was guys who just didn't buy into it, didn't really think it was going to work, those are kind of the guys that that ended up taking that stage exit left. You know what I mean? Those are kind of the guys that ended up kind of whittling out or they didn't buy in. They were lazy, didn't really want to go through the process of working. And I think that those guys kind of, you know, found a way to exit pretty quick. I tell you, I know you got one. We all saw it. We saw the the unearthing in, in this documentary was the Matt Drill tapes and just how hard it was. So I know you got a Matt Drill story for me. Who were <laughs> – who were you matched up against? Did it get heated? Did you know? Man, man. There was plenty. I've got plenty of stories about drills. Um, give, give, give me your best one. Most of them good. Okay. I, I, I'll tell you what, it, it, just in the nature of me, I'll give you my worst one. Okay. All right. and, and he'll laugh. And only because I'll give him his 10 minutes of fame. He's been dying. <laughs> He's been dying. He was hoping it was in the episode. He was hoping it was in the actual documentary. And I said, no, I told the, I told the producers, no chance. Uh, you got beat by a special teams player. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I discussed it. Nail on the head. Not not just any special teams player, mind you. You know, Buholt's finest, James Smith, right? It's Gainesville <laughs> native, the 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 long lost son of Gainesville, uh, <laughs> built like a brick house, and he's not built like your typical deep snapper. Uh, James Smith. This is probably hell. I don't know. This is 05. Choked me out. And I mean, I, I can't be the only one I got choked out. There's plenty of stories. Right. Where you, you listen to yeah, there, there was one in the video. Yeah, there was one in the dock. We saw a choke I out. No shame in it. I was going as hard as I could. He was going as hard as he could. And one of us had to lose. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I, I'm the one who lost that one. Uh, <laughs> if you see James Smith, he's about 5'10 and 225 and solid muscle. So I'll give him that. Listen, 6'7, 250 is <laughs> not necessarily conducive for wrestling. So. That was my that was my worst one. You know, I had some good ones, had some wins. I didn't lose that often, but I definitely lost that day. And Smitty, uh, Smitty had me choked out on the mat. I think I woke up about three minutes later to a couple of <laughs> in my face and got up and went and did uh, seat rolls right at the next station. So didn't stop, but not embarrassed about it. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Those the man. I, I don't even know. Could, could Urban Meyer get away with those today, or any coach? You probably. Let's be honest. You can't get away with anything today. It's, yeah. it's, it's as soft as the game's gotten. You know, those are one of those things that they, they probably have cinched it down pretty good. But you know, it was a different game back then. Yeah. Um, and I think for us, we're looking for anything to kind of you know 
behind that mental toughness aspect. That's what Urban was about. Mick Marotti was about that. And, you know, I don't hold it against him. I think that has a lot to do with not only how we were as a team and why we won championships. Um, I think it also has molded a lot of the guys now and where they're at in life, like where they're at in their professional careers, where they're at in their success in life is because that mindset, that mentality, there's a lot of mental toughness and there's not really anything. When you get past that, there's not a lot of things that can bring you down. You know, I mean, there's not something that can penetrate that that mentality. Football is back, and so is winning season at my bookie. NFL, college football, and the brand new cash out system give you options to bet and win all season long. First two legs of your parlay hit, well then cash out early and use the funds on another bet, or let it ride for the chance at a bigger payday. Use early cash outs as a tool to stay in control of the action at my bookie. To get started, go to mybookie.ag. Go there now and register for a free account. And when you're ready to make your first deposit, just use promo code GATORS to grab a welcome bonus. That welcome bonus is on the house. That's promo code GATORS to claim your deposit bonus. And for a limited time, get a free chip to use in the MyBookie Casino. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere with MyBookie. Gators Breakdown is proud to partner with AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. With 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, AG1 is raising the standard for quality in the supplement category. It replaces your multivitamin, probiotic, and more in one simple, drinkable, manageable daily habit. I now start my day with drinking AG1, and after pairing it with exercise and diet, I'm ready to tackle these busy days of football season. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash gators. That's drinkag1.com slash gators. Go there. Check it out. Gators Breakdown is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices, and the path forward isn't always clear. Whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. I've seen firsthand the difference therapy can make with a family member, and the relationship is now better, stronger than ever before. It's hard to take care of life challenges if you don't take care of yourself first, and that's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp brings the therapy to you. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com Gators today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Gators. Tay, we got to go to the tarmac. Uh, that that uh, you you were featured on that part in the documentary, and hey, as you said in the documentary, it was the it was the come to Jesus moment, as you say in West Texas. So, yeah. um, what it was, we we've heard about the story before, but that's probably the most in depth piece of it that that we've gotten in the Swamp Kings documentary. Um, I guess it, 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 of course coming after was that the that was after the LSU. South Carolina lost. Yeah. Uh, so losing to Steve Spurrier, of course, and that was pointed out. Didn't want to lose to the to Florida's favorite son. Um, does it uh, was I guess was that the turning point, you think, of or maybe Urban Meyer's tenure? I think it had a hell of a lot to do with the turning point. Um, there was so when you take that loss, you take the Alabama loss, the LSU loss in 05. 05 and 07 LSU to me are very similar as we're not really out of that game. We didn't play very good on offense in either one of those, in my opinion, but we weren't out of the game. And LSU was about as quiet as I've ever heard that stadium. Right? I've gone now for radio, and, and I've seen LSU at its best. And in 05 and 07 against Florida, to me, it was quiet. Like I've never really thought LSU was a tough place to play, but that's only because it wasn't loud when we played there. Um, it's been loud for plenty of games and I've seen plenty of games there, you know, in my mm-hmm. career on the sidelines, it's, it's definitely been loud, but for us, we were able to kind of keep it at bay. When you look at Alabama and you mentioned it earlier, 
we got curb stopped. I mean, that was a that was a game we'd like to have back. It was a terrible performance on our part. I think we're still trying to figure things out on offense, and we just didn't play that well on defense. Um, it was just an all around bad game. When you look at South Carolina, that was a stinger for us because that team wasn't as good as we were. Um, and and we start the game off with a turnover. You know, we had some really rough rough plays. We played you know not great on defense. I'd say subpar, but. What made it worse was we had a chance to still go to Atlanta and we had a chance to be in the run for the SEC championship game. And so it stung even worse when later that night, uh, I think it was, I want to say it was Georgia and Alabama. I can't remember exactly who played, but probably that time of year, Georgia, Auburn. I, I want to say it was Georgia beat somebody that, you know, sealed our fate no matter what. There's no way. Yeah. We, we, well, I'm sorry. No, what would have, if we would have won South Carolina game, we needed something to happen, and it happened. And so it stung even worse knowing had we beat South Carolina, we would have been in the SEC championship game more than likely. Yeah. And so for us, that was a, you know, a little bit of a gut punch, especially after the offseason and the, the coaching transition. But the tarmac conversation was one I don't think I've ever seen that. And maybe it was just like one of those things that we hadn't seen as players yet because we didn't have that situation with Zook. We didn't really have something like that addressed. But I've never seen a coach force coaches off the plane. You know, and we travel with staff, trainers, boosters, coaches, coaches' wives, everything. And they're usually in the back of the plane and the players are in the front, you know, you know two-thirds of the plane. And it was it wasn't that it was it was it was pissing a lot of people off, not just coaches, right? Like you hear laughters after a loss like that. If you really truly care about the season and, and what we could have accomplished after everything we had been through in the, in the you know January, February, March, it wasn't just Urban that was pissed off by it. And, and for the record, because like I know people probably watch the documentary and go, "Well, he was worried about his own job and blah blah blah." I, I think people don't understand that. There was a lot of people who were invested in buying in and going that route and getting to Atlanta. It pissed a lot of players off. And for a lot of us, it was like, and I'm glad, I'm glad it was addressed because, it, you know, there was players that said stuff to the players that were, were laughing at certain things. And there was guys who were pissed about it and yelling out. And I think that Urban and his own mind probably realized, like, I've got some guys over here that truly care and they're pissed right now. And then I've got some guys over here who could care less. They're ready to get back to Gainesville and, and try and find a party later on tonight. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it was really a turning point, and, and it's kind of nice that it was addressed. But it, unfortunately, it took two hours on the tarmac, so none of us got to go out that night. <laughs> uh, take two players that come to mind, and for different reasons, in Swamp Kings. And I thought they glossed over Chris Leak too much. There was not enough credit towards Chris Leak and what he was bringing to the table and, and, and all that. Don't get me wrong, Tebow deserves his praise, but Chris Leak also does as well. Uh, and I thought there was not enough love towards Chris Leak. Whether he wanted to be in the documentary or not, it could have been brought up uh, of how important he was uh, to, to the Gator team. But Man, the big revelation of Brandon Seiler. Like, it was, you know, he's a defensive player and doesn't really, you know, get the love because of Leak and Tebow in those years and, and the Urban Meyer offense. But I think a lot of people saw a side of Brandon Seiler that we really didn't know was out there. Well, and I love the fact that that's the untold portion of this, right? Like, there's, to be honest, with the content they had, um, they could have done a 10 part series. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably could have done a 10 part series for 06 and for 08 and, and really gotten to know the emotions, the mindset, the stress, you know, the, the, the ups and downs of every single player involved, every single, you know, coach involved. Um, Brandon Siler, I, I think for those of us in 04 class that, that know him and know what he's about, he, I mean, he's a warrior. I mean, he came, came up early, grew up under Channing Crowder in 04, right? Mm -hmm. At his time, that first year, and what's crazy is I think when you, when you watch the documentary and you hear guys like Brandon Spikes, right, later on, talk about being frustrated not playing freshman year and, and having to sit out. And then you, you see a guy like Brandon Seiler 
who had to sit that first year under a guy like Channing Crowder. And when Urban came in, it's a perfect scenario. You've got a defensive middle linebacker who is a, you know, an absolute stud, um, who has no problem speaking his mind, right? Who has no problem being the personality, was a leader, who was vocal, but he also was a leader who did everything that coach was asking him to do, right? It's a perfect situation. You've got a vocal guy who's, who's not willing to get, you know, get his hands dirty and go to work, but he's also going to demand everybody else do the same. And it's not coming from some slouch of a guy. I mean, it's coming from a guy who works his ass off. So love that, you know, and I think when you look at the transition from Siler to Brandon Spikes, it's one of those past the torch. Um, and I think Spikes probably had a little bit more respect the older he got for guys like Brandon Siler because they went through the same thing, right? I mean, you sit freshman year, you're used to being that guy on campus, the big man. Um, and having a city year is humbling. Um, for, for a lot of guys, you know, I didn't have to do it till my senior year, but it kind of eats at you. And I don't know what's worse. I don't know if sitting freshman year is worse yeah. than your senior year, but when you play your freshman, sophomore, and junior year, sitting your senior year is pretty miserable too. Uh, having to watch action in front of you for the first time and not being a part of it. So I, I thought Siler knocked it out of the park. Uh, for those that know Brandon, know his personality, I mean, you, you kind of can't get enough of him. And he'll give you all you can take, but he's definitely, he's definitely a hell of a person. Uh, he's an entrepreneurial spirit, man. He's definitely one of those guys you want to be in the trenches with. Take does, does 06 happen without Chris Leak? No. Okay. All right. And, and you mentioned, and you know, I should hit on Chris because I said it, you know, yeah. I, I, that's where I kind of like a lot of this interview process with the documentary, you almost wished it you could go, you know, extend it and hear a lot of the interviews because I can almost guarantee you there's so much there that just doesn't get told because yeah. you got to clip and edit and everything else. Um, I had a lot to say about the 06 season and, and Chris Leak not getting really a lot of uh, his due. You know, I think the work that Chris put in uh, from his freshman year, sophomore year, junior year leading up, uh, I mean, Chris was one of those guys that, that he was a homebody. I mean, he worked out, he showed up, he watched his film early in the morning, he got guys together for voluntary workouts. I mean, he was on top of his receivers, uh, making sure that guys were showing up to workouts they didn't have to show up to. And that was before Urban, right? And you inject Urban into this and you start getting guys that actually realize this is going to win us games if I do it versus, hey, you know what, I got something else to do. Like, I'll make the one next week. You know, Chris was one of those guys that could pull some, pull some dudes together and make them better. And I think when you kind of mix that with Dan Mullen and Urban Meyer, it wasn't a perfect offense for him by any means, right? Because Chris was not a running quarterback. He wasn't a kind of guy that, that, you know, you look at Tim Tebow and Cam Newton and say, God, those are the perfect quarterbacks for that offense. But he was one of those guys that understands he's a student of the game, right? He knew defenses. He knew exactly where, where he was supposed to put the ball. Um, and I think that sometimes it, it's really overlooked and unfortunately it comes, you know, prior to a guy like Tim Tebow who forget about it, you know, after that, you want a Heisman as a sophomore and you're arguably one of the, the top three college football players in the history of the game. You know, it's kind of an afterthought at that point. All right. We'll wrap up. Oh, six right there. As I say, everybody can go check out championship rewind. If you want specific championship game and all that, we go, heavy into being disrespected about <laughs> playing Ohio State. So yeah. there's more of that. Take, let's go to 07. And you and I, we, we haven't ever discussed 07, really. Uh, the kind of lost year in between besides Tebow winning the Heisman. What? I mean, look, there are so many things to point to. Look, it can be easily explained. Man, it lost a ton of talent off that 06 team. Lost a ton of experience. Yeah, there was a lot of talent, but was it – was it – settling for 06 was it too much experience you know what what's you know, I, you know what happened in, in 07 years that, that you think maybe kind of contributed most to the losses i think personally in 07 is one of those blur years for me you know i was out in 07 um, yeah that's when my injury and i redshirted but i think just my mindset looking at it you know from season on I think I played the first three games and then was injured was out for the rest of the year had surgery and came back in 08 but just looking at it, one we lost a lot of leadership and yeah. and I think that that was a transition from 
a very blue collar uh, 06 team to a very swagger 08 team, right? Who knew exactly how good they were. 06, we knew we were good, but we had a chip on our shoulder. You had a lot of blue collar mentality on that team. When those guys left, I think 07, you had a great recruiting class in 06. You had the 07 class, which was really, really good. Um, talented. I mean, star studded classes, both of them. But I think that when those young guys came in, I don't think they fully grasped how hard that 06 team had to work to get to 06. Right. So that first off season when Marathi and Urban first came in, it was way worse than 06. Right. By the time those guys came in, that that was the standard. That's what we did. They didn't go through the original 05. And mm-hmm. I can promise you, you go ask those guys that graduated in 05, that's probably the hardest workouts they've ever had to do. Um, my biggest thing is I think that, the, you know, some of the younger guys took for granted and rode the back of that national championship and thought highly of ourselves. And in 07, we got humbled. I mean, when you look at losses in 07, and, you know, you're talking, I believe it was Auburn. Uh, yeah. LSU lost to Georgia, you know, and, and the whole stomp uh, against Georgia. There was a lot of losses when you look back on it going, we were still really good, but I think that we weren't really mature. We lost a lot of maturity. We lost a lot of veterans. And I think that that presence at times hurt us, uh, not having the leadership that left, you know, because you had Brandon Siler left. You had Chris Leak. You had Dallas Baker left. You had Jamel Cornelius left. You know, you had guys on the offensive line that had left. Um, there, there's a lot there, and I just think that it, it took us a second to really regroup and get the leadership back. And I think that the documentary paints a pretty accurate picture, especially on defense with Brandon Spikes uh, from 07 to 08, how much he grew as a person and, and as a player uh, and as a leader. And so, you know, it's not easy coming by leadership. You know, I look at the Florida Gators in the last two, three years. I think that's one of our biggest problems right now is, is trying to find leadership. Uh, the talent's always going to be there. It's the discipline, the leadership, the small things. And if it doesn't mean much to you, man, it, it's hard to win big-time games. Take two more questions for you, now, and, and we'll let you get out of here. Thanks for, so much for doing this. You brought it up, the games that you lost in 07 – and the Georgia Stomp and what they were doing. Do, does the 08 season happen without that mindset of we got to go beat the hell out of Georgia? I don't know if we looked forward to any game more than we did that 08 Georgia. <laughs> um, and it wasn't like that was our Super Bowl. It was the total disrespect and Bush League bullshit that we dealt with in 07. Um, and I say Bush League because when you look at it, a lot of respect for Mark Rick, right? I, I mean, as a player, he was a, he's a good person, he's a great human being. They had great teams, they had great defenses. Um, those are the games that, like, you live for. If you go to the SEC, you live for the Florida Georgia game. Like, that is what you look forward to every year. I've heard guys say, like, we could have lost every game and won that one and be completely content. <laughs> and, and, in our minds, that, that's that's kind of bullshit. Like we probably could, but at the same time, we, we hate Georgia. Right. And it wasn't like a spy. Like at that point, Florida was kicking Georgia's ass for 20 years. So like, it, it wasn't like, oh, just, we're getting beat lately and we can't stand them. It was, that was so Bush league and something you would see out of like the whack conference to us that the video screens in the weight room for a year, and that's no exaggeration. And I'm not even BSing about that. No exaggeration for a year after that season, every montage on the video in the weight room, there was TV screens everywhere. We just got this new workout facility and it was on repeat for a year, the Georgia game. And that wasn't the only game that mattered to us, but we knew there was one mindset and it was kind of like metaphorically speaking for the rest of that whole season Right was we're going to go out, we're going to work our asses off from January all the way to August, September. And there's no chance that we're ever going to lose a game or be disrespected like that again. And I think when it came to the Georgia, the Georgia game that year, 
It's such a sweet feeling, man. You walk out of that game and we did every single thing that we set out to do. Not only did we do it, it was, it was come out, hit them in the mouth. We were looking to knock them out. And like those street fights where you keep punching, keep punching, even if the guy's down, like, forget about it. You disrespect, like, it's take it off the table. There is no such thing as disrespect anymore. And that was the best feeling in the world. The timeouts just made it even better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So go on, win a national championship in 2008. Like I said, Tate and I break that down in Championship Rewind right there on Gators Breakdown on YouTube. Check that out. Uh, even more from that season, too. Uh, Tate graduates, Florida falls to Alabama in 09, SEC championship game. Tate, last thought from you to kind of wrap up Swamp Kings. Did it surprise you how quick it all fell apart? I mean, the, the Urban Meyer, everything he built, everything he put you guys through and built this program to unimaginable heights. And then the loss of Alabama, it just seems to come crashing down and, and it doesn't last. He's got to take care of his health. I mean, for you to go through it and to get to be coached under this guy and probably all the respect in the world for what he did for you as a player and, and built this program up, are you surprised how fast it all came crashing down? So two things. Um, yes, I was a little bit, you know, surprised at how abrupt that ending was. But what you've got to understand about college football, and, and this goes to anybody out there that's going to college, that's high school guys, whether you're recruited or you're trying to make a decision. There's only one constant over time in the history of college football, and that is that the players will always be tied to that university. Coaches will too. But when we talk about coaches building something, Urban had a lot to do with it. But at the same time, the players had so much to do with that. And I got a lot of respect for Urban Meyer, right? Love him to death. That, that's my coach, and, and I'm one of those guys that bought in fully, and, and, you know, there's ways of doing things. But at the same time, as he, there's so much laid on a coach for building something up, and then it all came crashing down. Or mm. – you know, however you want to look at it, for us as players, we're as involved in building that up, right? And just like players make mistakes, coaches make mistakes, whatever that looks like and whatever that was, you know, I, I think it, it's a shame because I think all of us would have liked to have seen that go on for another five, ten years, right? We'd love to see, you know, that whole situation and no issues. And, you know, I mean, hell, let's be honest, Dave, we'd love to see Florida 10 and two right now and Urban yeah. Meyer still coaching if that was the case, but things happen. And I think that it, at some point you got to look back and go, it was a great run. You know, you, we enjoyed it while it lasted. Things change. And that's one of those things that you just got to kind of look back on and go, man, what would have been, um, it, it was abrupt. Um, but you know, I mean, everybody goes through their things. I think players, coaches alike, there, there's things that we go through in life, and it's not easy. And I know Urban was under a lot of pressure to win games. I, I know it can't be easy to uh, to be in his position, and I don't even really want to put myself in the mindset of what he had to go through. But, you know, it's unfortunate. I, I think for us as players, we'd love to see him uh, have, a, have a, you know, 10, 15-year career at Florida, and it didn't go that way, but – I think his guys and, and the ones that played under him understand exactly what he did at UF and how special it was. And I think for us, looking back on it, it, it is something to be celebrated. It's something to be proud about. Uh, I, I think there's too much made of the extracurricular stuff outside of outside of football because when you look at a locker room, you're talking about a handful of things versus a lot of guys who did things the right way, who went on to have great careers, who went on to be professionals. And you have a lot of guys who went on to be great human beings and great fathers and, uh, and now have done really well in life because of that kind of mentorship. All right. Yeah, there we go. Swamp Kings, check it out on Netflix. You get to hear more from Tate Casey right there, Brandon, Brandon Seiler, Urban Meyer, Tim Tebow, Dallas Baker, all you Gator favorites from, from, from those years. Uh, it was a lot of fun to check out. Tate, man, I uh, can't thank you enough, man. We'll see you on the sidelines coming up this year. All right. Appreciate it, big guy.